recognize where that passage comes from and what story that is. Um, Just out of curiosity's sake, how many of you were with us nine years ago? Okay, there's a whole bunch of you who weren't. (laughs) Okay, I'm revisiting something that I did nine years ago today. Um, And so I just wanted to, to, uh, uh, to share that with you. You know, the... The title that I gave this talk years ago was, You Might Be a Pharisee If. And some of you probably recognize that line, you might be a, what? Redneck if. You remember Jeff Jeff Foxworthy? Yeah, okay. Let's see. Um... You know, and, and, and he, he, he made rednecks the jokes on himself, the target of famous, you know, famous uh, uh, comedy routine. And he did a similar lampooning of Oregonians when he was here in the state, and it was pretty humorous. And the thing that makes these one-liners so funny is that most of them have a little bit of truth in them. But unfortunately, those stereotypes that are created by these kinds of statements are unjustly tarring all of that target class uh, with the same brush. And so just use the name of Pharisee, and what it calls to mind is a whole list of negative connotations. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit today. And I'm going to be I'm going to ask the Lord to to guide and direct. Father in heaven, we pray for again the outpouring of your Holy Spirit here, Father. I pray that uh, your word, your truth will be heard. I pray that uh, you will speak and that we will hear and that we will listen. And Father, we pray for the conviction that you want us to have and for the power of your spirit. We pray for the indwelling of your spirit now to open our hearts and our minds to see ourselves, to evaluate ourselves, and to come to you for cleansing, for reformation, for growth. We thank you now for this opportunity to hear your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, when we talk about the word Pharisee, we often think of somebody who is self-righteous who's hypocritical, a legalist, greedy, proud, uncaring, narrow-minded, critical. And Jesus told a parable about two men. This is in Luke 18. And we're all familiar with it. This is Luke 18, verse 10. Two went up to the temple. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. They're extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, is there anything wrong with not being an extortioner? No. Is there anything wrong with not being unjust? Is there anything wrong with not being an adulterer? Is it sinful to fast? Is it right and good to tithe? So what does this tell us about the Pharisee? He was honest, law-abiding. He seemed to be fair and chaste in his dealings with fellow men. He was serious about his religion and obedient to God. He recognized God's claims on him and his possessions. And there was nothing blameworthy about anything this man did or did not do. He was a model church member. And we could wish for a whole church full of people like him. This Pharisee desired to be obedient. He desired to do everything right. And he was even thankful for his blessings. The reason he fell under censure from Jesus is given back, we back up one verse to to Luke 18, verse 9, and where he says, 
And this is the parable Jesus says, And thus he, Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Jesus identified two problems. First one was he trusted in himself that he was righteous because of all the good things he did and because of all the bad things he didn't do. And he measured his state of salvation by his performance and his behaviors. And he judges his own character not by the holy character of God but by the character of other men. His mind is turned away from God to humanity and this is the secret of his self-satisfaction. He's comparing himself to another man. He was sure that all the good things he did and all the bad things he did not do commended him to God and therefore God was obligated to let him into the kingdom. And the second problem was that he compared himself to the publican and then he despised the publican. He looked to someone who was obviously not walking in the ways of righteousness to confirm to himself that he was actually very good. Good enough for God to approve and take to heaven. And the Pharisee judged and despised the publican for not being as holy and obedient as he was himself. Whoever trusts in himself that he is righteous will despise others. As the Pharisee judges himself by other men, so he judges other men by himself. His righteousness is estimated by theirs. And the worse they are, the more righteous, by contrast, he appears to himself. His self-righteousness leads to accusing. Other men he condemns as transgressors of God's law. And thus he is making manifest that very spirit of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. With this spirit, it is impossible for him to enter into communion with God. And he goes down to his house destitute of the divine blessing. Paragraph from Christ's Object Lessons, page 151. It doesn't matter whether you're not as bad as that other guy. It doesn't matter if you are not a drunk or not a drug addict or not an adulterer or not a thief. God does not grade on the curve or the best performers get A's. I tell this story on myself. <clears throat> when I was in high school, I got an A on the chemistry test. Not because I knew the material so well, but because everyone else did so bad. <laughs> Out of 120 points, I think I had 97, which is about 80% or less, which in most cases is not an A. Two students were above me with something like 102 and 109. We all three got A's because all those publicans in the rest of the class scored so low. I think the nearest score below mine was 75 out of 120, and I'm sure the professor wondered what he did wrong. <laughs> that you are a better performer than all the others in those other churches out there, or a better performer than everyone in this church, does not earn you any right to entry into the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah 40, or 64, 6 says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are what? As filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken or blown us away. All our obedience, all our own good deeds, and all our clean living do not make a score out of one, out of a possible 120 points. We stand a greater chance of buying a Rolls Royce with a handful of used toilet paper than we do of paying our way or earning our way into heaven with our own good behaviors. And if any of you look up the meaning of filthy rags here in this, in this Bible passage, my description is not far off. 
The problem of the Pharisee in this story is that he thought what he did earned him a place in the kingdom. He trusted in his own performance to get him in the door. He had made it in his own mind, and he was entitled to a place in heaven. In his mind, God graded on the curve, and as long as he was better than that other guy, he was in. The Pharisee was pretty happy with where he was. He was quite satisfied with his performance. He felt no need, and tragically, he felt no compassion for that struggling, sin-oppressed publican. And he felt free to condemn him and write him off as a lost cause. He felt no need to encourage the sinner in his struggles. This complacent, self-satisfied attitude is contemned in other scriptures, and one of those is aimed directly at us. <clears throat> and some of you already know of which I speak, because if you turn to your Bibles in Revelation chapter 3, you know what I'm talking about. Chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation contain messages from Jesus to the seven churches. And each one of these churches was an actual congregation during the times of John the Revelator. And each of these churches represented an era in the history of the Christian church from the times of the apostles until the end of the world. And that last church, the last of those churches receiving the last message to God's church was the church of Laodicea. The eras of all the other churches have passed, and we are now living in the time of the last church that will be on this earth prior to Jesus' return. So this message is clearly directed at us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. And in verse 14, we find the message to the church of the Laodiceans. <clears throat> And unto the church, or unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. Notice the church has works. I know thy works, he says, but there's no fire, there's no heat, there's no commitment. Too many in the church of Laodicea, too many of us are pew warming. We're playing church. Sure, we come to church on the true Sabbath. We're not extortioners. We're not unjust. We're not adulterers. We're not like those publicans out there. And we might even eat a vegan diet. <clears throat> we might fast. We might tithe and Bring veggie food to Pollock. And some even study their Sabbath school lesson. And I say some. Some of us don't. We have good works, but our works are without the fire of the Holy Spirit. The result of this condition is described in the next verse. It's nothing less than rejection by God because Jesus says... Because you're not, because you are lukewarm and not hot or cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This is a frightening warning. Tepid water is unsatisfying to drink, and it's unsatisfactory to God in this lukewarm condition, as is now described, and there is a cure that is pronounced for it. <clears throat> Tragically, just like the Pharisee in the parable, the church of Laodicea, which is us, is complacent, satisfied with its works. Now, the works are good things in themselves, but good performance, good behaviors too often lead to satisfaction with current conditions. And it leads to lukewarmness, self-satisfaction, and even then self-righteousness. And just like the Pharisee, comparing our good performance to that of the world around us results in us becoming self-deceived about our true condition. You might be a Pharisee if you're a Laodicean. 
The Lord says, you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Wow. He's saying that we as God's people don't realize how poor we really are. We don't realize how miserable our existence truly is as we exert ourselves and exhaust ourselves and struggle to be good and perform our good works. We're truly wretched. Jesus had something to say about that. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. If you're trying to earn your salvation, trying to do all the good works, come to me. I'll give you rest. Unfortunately, you know, many of us, some of us, talking to myself most of the time, are wretched, claiming to be a God's, God's person, but frequently not recognizing, like the emperor of fable, that we have no clothes. We need to have our eyes open to our condition, and it's not comfortable, it's not flattering, it's not fun to have our failures and our deficiencies pointed out. But if we refuse to accept correction, we will be spewed out. We'll be spat out in the dirt and humiliated. You know, being humiliated when Jesus comes means that we will be among those who are cast out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I tell this other story on myself. <clears throat> One morning as I was walking back to my office after hours of standing in court, I discovered that cold draft I was feeling was caused by the fact that my zipper was down. <clears throat> With a good deal of chagrin, I admonished my staff to never let me get out the door like that again. I did not want to be exposed and suffer the embarrassment and the humiliation resulting. I want to be told, I want to be warned if I'm about to appear before the judge of the universe without my pants on. Don't you? Jesus says, I counsel you, I advise you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And what does Jesus mean when he says, buy of him gold and clothing? How do we buy these things? What do we pay? He invites us to come to him. He'll give us rest for our souls. He says, ask of me and I will give you the living water. I will give you the water of life freely. He invites us to the wedding feast and he gives us a royal garment. All of these things are free. For the asking. We buy without gold. We buy without price. Because he is willing to give it. If we'll ask for it. Christ's Object Lessons 158 says. The gold tried in the fire is faith. That works by love. Not faith. Or not works. To earn. Something. This is faith that works by love. It's not works to earn. It says only this can bring us into harmony with God. We may be active. We may do much work. But it must be faith that works by love. <clears throat> says, no man can of himself understand his errors of ourselves. We can't see our nakedness of ourselves. We can't see that we're poor and miserable. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The lips may express a poverty of the soul that the heart does not acknowledge. Ooh. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. 
Proud of being humble? Have you heard of that? Have you seen people do that? Yes, you have. And that's a risk for each one of us is that we can become proud of being humble. And then we're not humble. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Jesus. We must look at Jesus. It's, it's our ignorance of him that makes us sometimes so uplifted in our own righteousness. And when we contemplate his purity and his excellence, we'll see our own weaknesses and poverty and defects as they really are. It's uncomfortable. But that's what needs to happen. We'll see, our, we'll see ourselves as lost and hopeless, clad in our garments of our own self-righteousness, just like every other sinner. We shall see that if we're ever to be saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but only through God's infinite grace. We know that the garments are the robe of Christ's righteousness that we must wear. His perfect obedience, his perfect performance must stand in the place of our pitiful performances. It's free, but it costs everything at the same time. What does I mean by that? It costs daily dying to self. Daily surrender. Daily submission. Hourly submission to his will and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There's a chapter in Christ's Object Lessons on the Pharisee and the publican, and, publican, and I'd encourage everybody to go read it in full. But here it says, No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. And then here's this sentence that I marked out and highlighted. And it says, but no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish this work. As much as I recognize that I am self-centered and selfish and unsurrendered. I cannot do it myself. As much as I know that I need to surrender, that I need to submit, I can't do it. And here's a little prayer that my father had on a 3 by 5 card that was given to him when he joined the church in the 1950s. <clears throat> this is again from Christ's Object Lessons uh, 159. It says, Then, when we recognize that we can't empty self of self and we can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work, this statement says, Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart for I cannot give it. It's thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere, for the rich current of thy love can throw flow through my soul. I pray that prayer about every day. Because I can't give my heart. I have to ask him to take it. I can't empty myself of myself. And this the paragraph goes on. It says, it's not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual earnest heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before him. 
Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. Again, Christ's Object Lessons 159. In the book, uh, Faith and Works, there's a reference to the message to Laodicea, and it, and it says, Here is represented a people who pride themselves in their possession of spiritual knowledge and advantages. Do we pride ourselves on having the truth? And more of it. Oh, yeah. But they have not responded to the unmerited blessings that God has bestowed upon them. They've been full of rebellion, ingratitude, and forgetfulness of God, and still he has dealt with them as a loving, forgiving father deals with an ungrateful, wayward son. They have resisted his grace, abused his privileges, slighted his opportunities, and have been satisfied to sink down in contentment, in lamentable ingratitude, hollow informalism, and hypocritical insincerity. With Pharisaic pride, they have vaunted themselves till it has been said of them, Thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And has not the Lord sent messages after message of rebuke, of warning, of entreaty to these self satisfied ones? Have not his counsels been despised and rejected? Have not his delegated messengers been treated with scorn and their words received as idle tales? And I believe this was written after the 1888 message. Christ sees that which man does not see. He sees the sins, which if not repented of, will exhaust the patience of a long-suffering God. Christ cannot take up the names of those who are satisfied in their own self-sufficiency. He cannot plead in behalf of people who feel no need of his help, who claim to know and possess everything. Jesus counseled then, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As shepherds of the flock, our pastors, our elders, find ourselves in positions of rebuking and chastening sometimes. We all want you in the kingdom. In the past, we had an emphasis on, on, we've had emphasis on certain issues like tithing. Not because our local congregation benefits from the tithe, but because the Bible says we're cursed with a curse if we hold the tithe, withhold the tithe. We don't want anybody to suffer that. We don't want the congregation to fall under that. But then, on the other hand, if some of us are proud of our tithing, feeling that it makes us better than those who have not been tithing, then we're no better than that misguided Pharisee. The good deed of tithing then becomes nothing more than filthy rags. Our self-righteousness becomes disgusting to others, and it is disgusting to God. And so I ask, why is it that so often I find myself struggling with works of legalism? Putting on the filthy rags and trying to convince myself and everyone else that I'm a righteous person. Why is it that the Pharisee of the parable went home from church without the blessing of heaven? The Bible records another story about a Pharisee that helps us understand these questions. There's a heart condition at the bottom of it all. Failing to perform the works of a committed Christian reveals the condition of our heart because it's so obvious that our lives are not in harmony with the heart of Jesus. But then performing the works and being faithful to our obligations to the church and to the others does not really reveal the condition of our hearts. We can look good. It does not bring the censure of the church down on us. So, I look at that and I say, those of us, those of you who are the pillars of the church, who are faithfully carrying out your duties and responsibilities and meeting the needs of the flock, we could be in spiritual danger without knowing it. Because our heart condition may not be so obvious. 
And the question I ask is, how then can we know the condition of our heart? As was noted in that statement above, in Christ's Object Lessons, quote, in one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. Close quote. We must know and experience the infinite love of Jesus because without love, without such love as dwelt in the heart of Jesus, we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. What's that? We must have the love that dwelt in the heart of Jesus. All our good works must be done in faith that works by love. And when I ask myself how much I love Jesus, I'm frightened by the answer that my works tell me. My neglect of duty in some cases reveals that my love is small. My pride in the works that I do indicate that my works may not be motivated by love at all. Unless love for Jesus and my brother is the motivation for my good deeds, they amount to no more than those boasted filthy rags of the Pharisee. In the story of Jesus at the home of Simon the Pharisee, the issue of love as motivation came up. Simon was also known as Simon the leper, and the story is recorded in all four Gospels. And it took place just before Jesus entered Jerusalem to public acclaim and excitement. It was just a few days before his death. As a Pharisee, Simon was of the group that believed that the Messiah would come when all the people perfectly obeyed the laws of Moses. And the Pharisees were diligent in trying to be obedient to every command of God. So it must have been a real shock to Simon when he contracted leprosy. Because leprosy was viewed as a punishment of God for great sin. It must have been extremely humiliating to Simon to know that everyone was examining his life and his history to find out what his great sin was and why God was punishing him. As a leper, Simon would have been cast out of his home, separated from his family, abandoned and shunned by all friends and business associates. He would be unclean and untouchable. He was under the curse of God. That's what everybody thought. That's what he thought. And so his life would have become one of loneliness and privation. So to be healed from such a deadly disease and be restored to a place among the living was a gift beyond price. Because of his miraculous healing, Simon became a follower of Jesus, hoping that Jesus might be the Messiah. And in acknowledgement for what Jesus had done for him, Simon prepared a feast for Jesus and his disciples. Now there are many others were present, and inclu- present there at that uh, at that feast, including Lazarus and Martha, Simon had a double attraction with both Jesus and Lazarus at his table, and many from Jerusalem walked the two miles to come and gawk. As a Pharisee, Simon would not have engaged in anything questionable or that would have been seen as sinful or defiling at this feast. And so some who have spread the idea that Jesus was a party animal for attending weddings in this banquet have misapplied scripture. Jesus was not a party animal. Now, as was the custom in those days, the important attendees at such a function lay on couches with their heads toward the table and their feet away. And Luke 7, which we read in our scripture, records the incident in which a woman of the city, Mary, stood at his feet behind him weeping. She probably wouldn't have been noticed in all the coming and going of the servants, including Martha, her sister, who was also serving But Luke describes her as a woman of the city and a sinner. 
The Apostle John in his gospel writes, identifies her as Mary. And apparently during some of those times sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him, she had come to understand that Jesus expected to die soon at the hands of the rulers of the Jews. And so understanding and believing Jesus more than the other disciples, she purchased this bottle of very expensive perfumed oil. And due to this cost, this oil was only used for very special occasions and generally only by the very wealthy. And such oil would frequently be used on the dead prior to burial. This box of oil cost a year's wages for the average working man. Can you imagine? Jesus had forgiven her many times and he had never despised her. He had never belittled her. He had always been kind and considerate. Much the opposite of every other religious man who would berate her as a sinner, humiliate her and shun her. Knowing his death was near, she was heartbroken and wanted to express her love and gratitude to Jesus. And as she stood at his feet, she was overcome by her grief. Sobs and tears. With sobs and tears, she poured this most valuable thing she owned on his feet and head. No self-respecting woman would let her hair down in public and only the lowliest of servants would be forced to kiss feet or wipe a man's feet with their hair. But Mary voluntarily stooped to perform this act. She had no pride. She was a known sinner. And she knew everybody knew it. But Jesus made her feel like someone of value and for him, she would gladly humble herself. When the box was broken open and the scent of the oil filled the house, everyone immediately knew something unusual was going on. And when it became known what she was doing, Mary was loudly and indignantly criticized for her expensive, wasteful act of devotion. Why this waste, they demanded, Judas being the leader among those. Now the criticism of her was also a criticism of Jesus for allowing her to do this. And Judas justified his complaint, appealing to the needs of the poor, but he had no soft spot either for the poor or for penitent sinners, and he stirred up the resentments of others and of Simon the host himself. Because Simon then silently questioned in his own mind whether Jesus could truly be a prophet in spite of the miraculous healing he had received from Jesus. He knew who and what this woman was and that she was a known sinner. As a Pharisee, he also knew that a righteous man didn't have contact with known sinners. He reasoned that if Jesus were a true prophet, he should know that this woman was a sinner and he should denounce her in front of everyone and drive her away. But Jesus, knowing the doubts and thoughts in Simon's mind, engaged in a parable, much as the prophet Nathan had done with David, and he said, Simon... I have somewhat to say unto thee, Luke 7, verse 40. And he says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. That's about two years wages, 500 pence. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And in this parable, the debtors had no right to expect anything from their creditor. They could offer nothing. They had nothing with which to repay. Their situation was hopeless. They had nothing to recommend them to the creditor except their absolute helplessness. That's the only qualification for God to freely forgive. That's the only qualification for God to freely forgive us is that we are helpless. And we must acknowledge that we are helpless and we have no way to pay. So when Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Desire of Ages tells us that Simon was responsible 
for leading Mary into a life of sexual immorality. Jesus knew this, yet he did not expose Simon. He did not embarrass him in front of the crowd. And Simon realized that Jesus knew all about it. Then Jesus compared how they both had treated him on this day. And he said to the woman, he says, he turned to the woman and said to Simon, See this woman? I entered your house. You didn't give me water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So then, what did gratitude for the forgiveness of her many sins cause Mary to do? She stopped thinking of herself and concentrated on showing Jesus how thankful she was and how much she valued him for what he had done for her. She performed her act of devotion, her good deed that Jesus appreciated, with no thought of approval from anyone but Jesus. She wasn't doing it for anybody else. It was only for her love for him. Her love for Jesus drove her to this extreme demonstration of devotion. And Jesus then made a direct application of forgiveness of the debtors in the parable with forgiveness of sins. He compared the actions of the woman who had many known sins to the actions of one who thought he did not have many sins. Mary's actions revealed that she believed she was a great sinner. The actions of Simon revealed that he did not believe that he was a great sinner. Yet from the... From the perspective of, of the times, who was it that had suffered under the curse of God? Who got leprosy? It was Simon. It was Simon and not the woman. He had had no chance of ever having a life again until Jesus granted him mercy. Simon's leading Mary into sin made him responsible for all her sins which he caused her to do. So while his sin was actually greater than hers, he did not feel that he had much to be grateful for. So Jesus said to her, Thy sins are forgiven. And he said to her, Your faith has made, saved you. Go in peace. What faith did she have? She believed that she had been forgiven and acted like it. She was overflowing with gratitude. And unless we come to the realization of how much we have been forgiven and how much we have to be grateful for, we will not love much. We will love little. And our works will show where we are in our relationship with Jesus in our relationship with what he's done for us. You know, some of us have been in the church all our lives. We haven't been out in the world. We haven't gone wild. So we tend to think that we haven't been all that sinful. We feel that we haven't needed to be forgiven much. Consequently, all too often our lives don't reveal that overflowing gratitude. We don't reveal that commitment or that devotion to the will of Jesus. And sometimes it reveals that we may not love much because we tend to compare our guilt, perceived guilt, with the obvious guilt of the ungodly. And we start comparing ourselves with other people out there. We don't feel so guilty. Yet in the eyes of God, in the eyes of his law, how guilty are we? We are just as guilty as the baddest person out there that we see doing horrible things. We're guilty of the death penalty. Every one of us is guilty of the death penalty. 
Every sin separates us from God and separates us from life. And so it doesn't matter how small or how big we think a sin might be, any sin is an automatic death penalty. All Adam and Eve did was steal fruit. I studied about that in the lesson this morning in Sabbath school. All Nadab and Abihu did was use the wrong fire. All Uzzah did was touch the ark. There's no such thing as a little sin. All of us are sinners as low as Mary. The question is, do we realize that the forgiveness that Jesus extends to us is just as great as he extended to Mary? Do we appreciate it? Do we appreciate it? Do we love as much as she did? The only way we can live lives of self-abandon as Mary is to see Jesus up close, personal, every day. That's the only way. We need to see him bleeding on the cross. We need to hear him saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know how bad they actually are. They don't know what they're doing. We need the Holy Spirit to convict us of the terrible nature of sin though, so that we realize how much Jesus has forgiven each of us. We need that Holy Spirit. We need to feel, as Mary did, that our sins have been and are so many and so terrible that the forgiveness of Jesus is such a precious gift that it requires our unreserved gratitude and total devotion. It requires our complete commitment and submission to the will of Jesus. Half-hearted Christianity is not Christianity at all. Well, with Jesus, it's all or nothing. He would rather we be hot or cold, not this tepid going through the motions type of religiosity. After forgiving great sin, Jesus often said, go and sin no more. And that is still his command to us today. It means that when we are fully surrendered to him, we will gladly abstain from those things he told us to leave alone. But it also means that we will gladly do all the things which he commanded us. And because he then becomes the greatest love of our lives, we'll be looking for ways to please him. We'll not be looking to slide into heaven by meeting minimum requirements. We will be seeking to fully reflect the life of Jesus in every action and in every thought. You might be a Pharisee if what? I don't know about you. But I pray that God will forgive me and help me because all too often I am a Pharisee. I want to love much and show it in my life. I want to please my Jesus every day. The solution to the Laodicean problem The cause of the Laodicean problem is not having Jesus in the heart. He says, I'm standing outside knocking on your heart's door. Knock, knock. Open up. Let me in. And then when he comes in, all these things get resolved. He then starts the cleaning up process. He provides the power and the insight and the knowledge for us to see who we really are. And he provides the forgiveness and the grace that says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace covers all of these problems that the Holy Spirit has revealed to you. And we're told, now therefore there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and called according to his purpose. We can stop feeling guilty when we accept the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. And we can have rejoicing. We can have fullness. But we need to see Jesus. We need to invite him in. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit.
So I was working on something else. Is that in preparation for the soon coming of Jesus, the Holy Spirit needs to be working in our hearts now. He needs to be preparing us, cleaning out the garbage, sanctifying, so that when the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, we are prepared to receive it. We can't get ready to receive it then. It's too late. We must be prepared to receive it now and be getting ready to receive it now so that when it does come, we can go forward with power and assurance and confidence. We need to be asking for the Holy Spirit to come in and for Jesus to dwell in our hearts as the solution to the Laodicean problem, as the solution to the Pharisee problem. Let's do that. Let's pray. My Father, you know who I am. You know what I am. Forgive me for the low value that I put on my Savior. The low value that I put on his suffering for me. I pray, forgive me for loving so little so that my good deeds are self-centered and self-righteous. Forgive me for being lukewarm. Open my eyes to see Jesus so that I can see myself as I truly am. Make my obedience the obedience of love and gratitude because all my filthy rags are covered by Jesus' perfect obedience. And he stands in my place. Help me, Father, to be like Jesus, to love much. Create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. And give me the heart and the mind of Jesus. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And Father, I pray this prayer not for myself alone, but for each and every one here. Send your spirit into each heart and mind so that we can go down from your house today. Go down to our houses, justify. Because we have claimed the promise and the grace of Jesus. That if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. He forgives. He cleanses. So Lord, we pray that today each one of us will go home justified. And I ask for a blessing on each one. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.